During our last session, we discussed some aspects of the deacon's petition concerning harmony and trust in marriage. Today, we will look at the, into the following two petitions, which ask God to bless the marriage with a blameless life and an undefiled bed. I will read the first one, that he may keep the course and manner of their life blameless. Let us pray to the Lord. As we mentioned in the previous sessions, the Christian marriage becomes meaningful when it rises above the secular dimension. In other words, when it transcends the boundaries of the visible reality of space and time and anticipates the kingdom of God. In other words, a marriage, according to our church, acquires its true meaning when the actions of the spouses are directed and aligned towards the kingdom of God, which is the ultimate purpose of this earthly life. So the prayers of the church in the mystery of marriage embrace the entire person, the entire journey of men, and the church prays for a blameless manner of life. Now, what is this blameless manner of life? Does it mean that we have to become blameless, sinless, or flawless in a literal sense? No, my young friends, there's no such person in this world. Unfortunately, we all sin and fall short of the kingdom of God. We all have our weaknesses, falls, and sins, and all these things will most likely accompany us through our life's journey. No one is pure in front of God. We all have our debts and trespasses. However, our sinfulness should not keep us from wanting to live the life of God, the life of Christ. And our life will become more and more blameless when we make a daily effort to have Christ live in us. Since Christ's life is blameless and spotless, the more we become Christ-like, the more Christian and blameless our life will become. This was the daily concern of all our saints, and Saint Paul, who was finally able to say, I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in me. As Christians, we will, we, we will have falls, we will sin from our weaknesses, but nevertheless, we are aspiring to live the life of Christ, which is blameless. Not to mention that the Christian struggle is not about sinlessness. No one is sinless, and we will never become sinless. We will journey through this life carrying the weight of our sins. We don't lose our relationship with God if we are not sinless or flawless, but we lose our relationship if we isolate ourselves from God, if we don't learn how to repent, and if we don't ask for forgiveness and guidance every day, and especially if we allow our failures, shortcomings, and weaknesses to overwhelm us or make us despair. No matter what problem we have, what passions we may have, we don't lose heart. Despondency is the most powerful weapon of the devil. We acknowledge our weaknesses and passions, which we may not be able to overcome at this moment, but this is no reason to give up the fight. We continue our spiritual life, we seek the assistance of our church and of our spiritual father, and we trust that God will do our fighting for us. And since we have a guest with us today, Father Zacharias from Essex, I would like him to add a few thoughts along these lines. Welcome, Father Zacharias. Father Zacharias just got in from England, and uh, for those of you who don't know him, Father Zacharias is a disciple of Elder Sophroni and lives uh, at the monastery of Essex. Please come uh, to speak to the uh, young students for a few minutes, Father Zacharias. Well, I, I really did not want to talk tonight. I came to simply get the blessing of Bishop Athanasios and to hear him speak. But I don't know. It looks like everywhere I go, I end up speaking. And now I, I have to deal with this passion as well. Anyway, I'm happy to be here and even happier to hear 
the hygienic teaching of your metropolitan, the spirit-filled teaching that leads to health and spiritual wellness, as St. Paul says, a teaching that we can certainly build upon. As I was hearing the words of the bishop, I thought of something similar from the Old Testament. I will try to say it in less than five minutes so we can let His Eminence continue with your lesson. Now, you all probably remember some Bible stories from the Old Testament. I know you're college students and, you know, you may not read a lot, uh, a lot of the scriptures, that is. But uh, I'm sure you remember from your elementary lessons, the book of Genesis, and the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We read in these chapters of Genesis that the blessing of the patriarch was binding, and whoever received that blessing, God was somehow indebted to fulfill the promises given to the patriarchs. As you remember, Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. God wished to bless Jacob, but according to the law of that time, Esau was the firstborn, so the blessing of the birthright belong to Esau. But God is not bound by human law, so Rebecca helped along these lines. She favored Jacob, so she conspired with him to deceive the very old and blind Isaac to bless Jacob instead of Esau. You all know the story, so I will only mention the key points. After this, the life of Jacob was in great danger from his brother, and he needed to leave immediately. His mother sent him to her brother Laban, where he worked many years under very difficult circumstances, but the hand of God was with him, and everything he touched was blessed by God, and Jacob prospered. Many years later, he became very tired from the ill treatment of his father, father-in-law, and he could not take it anymore, and he wished to return to the land of his father where he grew up. After escaping from his difficult father-in-law, now he's terrified because his brother Esau is coming against him with 400 men seeking revenge, seeking his death. He was stuck between a rock and a hard place, as we say, and living with his father-in-law became impossible and now he has to deal with the fury of his betrayed brother. So Jacob, afraid and distressed, spent that entire night in prayer. And the scripture says that he wrestled with God all night. During daybreak, he felt a presence. And this presence, who's wrestling with Jacob, and his presence is God the Word before the Incarnation, tells Jacob, let me go for the day's breaking. There's a there's daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Then he heard the voice of God. Since you have prevailed with God, you will also be mighty with men. Since you have a powerful relationship with God, now your dealings with men will be a piece of cake, as we say in England. That morning, Jacob got up totally empowered and rejuvenated and went to meet Esau. He was confident now because the promise and the blessing of God was upon him. The words of God were resonating in his ears. Since you have prevailed with God, you will be mighty with men. He sees Esau advancing towards him with 400 men to kill him. And when he drew near, he began to fall down before him. Every few steps, Jacob would do a full prostration in front of his brother. He did this seven times. After these seven prostrations, the heart of Esau was totally changed, and Esau embraced his brother, fell on his neck, and sobbed. After this, the wives of Jacob drew near and his children, and they also began to bow down to Esau, who was a changed man by the grace and humility of his brother. 
Jacob began to beg him to receive half of his flock as a gift, and Esau did not want to hear it. No, my brother, I have plenty. Jacob insisted, Please, my brother, you will do me a great favor if you keep my offering. Please receive my present from my hand. Inasmuch as I have seen your face, I have seen the face of God. I brought this powerful incident up from the Old Testament because it beautifully confirms everything that our beloved Metropolitan has been saying to you. If we want to strengthen our relationships with people, then we must begin by solidifying our relationship with God. We need to be reminded that the Word of God is eternal. Heaven and earth will pass by, but not a single iota will pass from the Word of God. If we want to develop true and sincere relationships with people, we must wrestle with God and develop the proper and correct relationship with God first. Once we have a solid and true relationship with God, then in the light of this relationship, we will be in a position to discern and properly evaluate all other relationships around us. Only then, we will be constantly fulfilling the two great commandments of God, which happen to pave the road and the path that leads to life. When I learn to love God with all my heart, and strength and soul, only then will I be disposed to love my neighbor properly, which is to love my neighbor as myself. Forgive me, but I need to stop here. Thank you, Father Zachariah. And uh, Father Zachariah will be speaking at some nearby churches this weekend, and those of you who are free, uh, you may want to go hear him. And now we will continue with another petition, which is similar to the previous one. That the Lord God may grant unto them an honorable marriage and a bed undefiled, let us pray to the Lord. Here the church is not afraid to speak about the couple's bedroom. The church sanctifies the union of these two people. It sanctifies people's relations and continues to pray for an, for an undefiled bed at a time where carnal sins and sexual uh, corruption has reached unprecedented dimensions. Virginity and purity are not popular today. These are concepts of the Middle Ages, according to some of our progressive neighbors, who may even laugh at us just for speaking about them. Unfortunately, though, all this progress and all these sexual revolutions have not helped our marital love at all. On the contrary, all this libertarianism has brought destruction upon society, which stems from the dysfunction of the family unit. I'm invited as, as a metropolitan, I'm invited weekly to all these different seminars with all kinds of specialists attempting to address various social issues. Seminars for child abuse, seminars for hooliganism in the soccer fields and on the sidewalks, on the sidewalks, uh, vandalism, physical abuse of teachers by students, and so on. I wish you were there to hear the sheer brilliance of some of these uh, masterminds. They all, they try to discover the cause of all, th of all these things, and these are some of the solutions they offer. We need more psychologists in the school. Oh, the problem is with the Ministry of Athletics. They didn't build enough basketball courts to keep the youth occupied. The problem is, uh, you know, again, with the Ministry of Athletics, they are, we don't have enough soccer fields. We blame everybody except ourselves. This is how we always try to solve our problems. We blame everyone, everyone else, for them. The Turks are at fault. The British are at fault. The Americans have got us into this, those bad television shows. Everyone is at fault except us. And with this kind of mindset, we will never assume responsibility for any of this. And we'll never even guess that all this, caused, all this is caused by the absence of God in these children's souls. Through this confusion, we don't realize that when the family unit suffers, then 
the entire society will suffer. Postmodernism and the sexual revolution has made us lose the sensorium of what it means to have an honorable marriage and an undefiled bed. We have lost the sensorium for many things today. The way people dress, for example. You see a person in church and you politely try to tell them that, look, uh, you are dressed inappropriately. You're dressed very provocatively. And you dare tell them, look, my friend, you are not dressed properly. They look at their semi-naked self from top to bottom and they ask, what's wrong with me? I don't see anything wrong. They don't understand. They have lost the measure. They don't understand that our grandmothers, only a few generations back, would not even wear this type of clothing in their bedrooms, let alone out in public. They have lost the sense of modesty. The same holds true for many other areas in people's lives. Take, for example, a person who had multiple relations of the carnal kind, physical relations, with many partners. He has abased himself and everyone he has been with and will be with. How can this man understand and see the human body as the temple of the Holy Spirit? How can he understand that our body parts are members of the body of Christ? The great worth and theology of the human body, which needs to stay sanctified and treated with the utmost respect, just like the entire person. How can this fleshly person even understand the meaning of an honorable and undefiled marriage? Especially today when this kind of corruption has polluted the minds of even the elementary school students through TV and internet pornography. We must be an un underdeveloped country after all, because we have surpassed the West in this area. In other developed countries, improper or X-rated movies are not played on, on public TV channels. Here in Limassol, I hear parents complaining that as early as eight o'clock at night, some local TV channels dare show these terrible movies with the full knowledge that small children will be exposed to this insanity. As a confessor, I can attest to this because I have heard this over 15 times from small children. It is well known that children like to copy the actions of adults. Over 15 children have told me that whatever they saw in these terrible videos, they tried with their younger siblings and cousins. Don't let this surprise you. The corruption or destruction rather brought about through the porn industry is worse than any other plague we have experienced. Thank God these evils did not exist during our teenage years. We, we hardly had any television at home. People had to go to watch television at the coffee houses. And I remember during the 60s, broadcasting was limited to two nights a week from 7.30 until 10 o'clock at night. Now TV has seen its better days as it has been slowly replaced by the World Wide Web uh, engines. And uh, these engines can bring any video in the palm of someone's hand in a split second. Now we can't blame technology, although the merchants of the earth know how to exploit people's passions and weaknesses as they are ready to sacrifice everything to satisfy mammon, their idol of greed. But woe to the young people who have been brought up with these images which can be highly addictive. What kind of marriage are they going to have? They will look at their spouse the same way they lusted over these videos. From the moment you begin to see your wife in this awful way, you have destroyed your marriage. A marriage and a family cannot stand under these circumstances. You may demand and force the other person for a while, but at some point they will become full of disgust, full of resentment because of your lack of respect and vulgarity. Not to mention that the other person is not a robot. They are not a machine. There are certain times where the other person may not be available in that way. They may become ill and not capable to bow down to your demands. 
It is truly tragic to see and hear long-lasting relationships, long-lasting romances go down the drain because there's a certain differentiation in the physical sector of their life. This addiction can take extreme dimensions when one of the two partners faces a health, a health problem. As confessors, we are in the unfortunate position to hear some of these most horrible ordeals, which my young children should do your best to avoid at all costs. The wife may be dying from cancer, and the husband cannot wait a few months for her to die. No, he needs a divorce to go marry another woman for obvious reasons. My son, wait a couple weeks. Wait until she dies. A few weeks of patience. But how? To him, that's what marriage is all about. Or you tell this other one, wait a few months until your wife gives birth. Another problem. No, no, they, they can't wait. How can they wait when their entire conception of marriage has been built on pleasure and carnal relations? He's not able to see his spouse as a person with a proper respect. He does not understand that his marriage is supposed to be honorable and his bed undefiled and that he cannot always do whatever he pleases. The marriage bed was something sacred up until a few generations ago. Our grandmother would not even enter the bedroom of my parents, and when she would visit, we would try to push her to go in, to make her go in, but she would refuse. She would not want to go in. She was embarrassed to enter her daughter's bedroom out of reverence. She considered it sacred. No, no, it is not proper for us to go into your parents' bedroom. If she only knew what happens today, marriage and the bedroom and marital relations was something very sacred. That's why no matter what happened in their lives or their marriages, they did not abandon one another. Their focus was not on the carnal element, but they transcended these relations for the higher purpose of marriage. I think that I told you this before our grandparents would not even dress or undress in front of each other. My grandmother would bring the wash clothes for my grandfather. She would put them on his bed and she would walk out, close the door, so he could get dressed. Today, couples walk naked in the house, like animals. The degradation is such that people think that there's nothing wrong with this. This is tragic. And all this in the name of freedom a freedom that leads to bondage and the eventual destruction of marriage. When these carnal relations are isolated from the higher purpose of marriage and they become the focus, they soon become meaningless and even disgusting to some of our very young people who immerse themselves into these relations very young, looking for some meaning in life. This did not bring the necessary fulfillment to their lives, and then they moved on to drugs, drugs and narcotics to find some purpose. And during counseling, you suggest to them, listen, uh, my young friend, why don't you want to meet a young woman to raise a family? No, they're not interested. They tried it all. They are not moved by this. They were not touched by love. They simply experience some physical gratification and falsely assume that if that's what marriage is all about, I don't want it. Who needs it? We tried it already. And despair sets in. There's nothing in this life worth living. And some of them commit suicide. This is the tragedy of today's wrong sense of freedom. True freedom can only come from following the commandments of God. The main purpose of God's commandments is to propel man's soul towards God's perfect freedom, which is the liberation from the sinful passions. The commandments free us from the slavery of passions and propel us toward the love of God, which is the first and most basic of all the commandments. That's how the merit of bed can stay undefiled when man learns to love God beyond and above the selfish pleasures and hedonistic passions that lurk inside of him. 
the primary momentum of man's love must be turned to God. We repeated many times before, my young friends, that man is an absolute image of God. Man is God by grace. When man wishes to discover himself, to find himself, to learn how to function properly, he needs to take a very good look at the attributes of God and try to adopt them in his life. God is the prototype, the original, and we are his uh, photocopy, so to speak. So we strive to adopt and bring these energies of God in our lives, which will ultimately determine our lot in the life to come. If we are similar to God, if we are God-like, we will live with God forever, eternally. If we are totally dissimilar to God, we will be eternally separated from him. St. John tells us that God is love. Now, love is one of the energies of God. There's a subtle point here that needs to be addressed. We said that God is love, but love is not God. What do we mean by this is God is a person. And as a person, he reaches out and embraces the entire creation with his energy of love. And he offers his being to his creation. He communes with us, with his creation, with the energy of love. But love as we understand it is not God because love is not a person. It is simply an idea or a philosophical value and not a person. Our church does not speak about ideas or values. We are not here to become full of values, but as Christians, we strive to be filled with Christ and with the grace of the personal triune God. There's much talk today about values, but no matter how good and noble these values may seem to be, like freedom, equality, love and justice, they are worthless and not acceptable to our church if they are not grounded and connected to the life of the gospel. These values cannot stand by themselves and cannot be offered in a pure form in the absence of a pure heart. This is hard for some people to understand, I know, but and uh, these people sometimes question the church. Now, why does the church frown upon premarital relations? Uh, we are in love. We love each other. So we are acting out of love. You know, this kind of love fulfills us. Yes, but the church does not speak about love, freedom, justice, equality. The church speaks about God who is love. We are baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity, in the name of Christ, and not in the name of some love. The love of God is drastically different from the loves of this world. For man to act naturally, he needs to reach out and offer his love to God first. The purpose of all the commandments is to help man to surrender his entire life to God, since only then he can express himself naturally. This is the purpose of marriage as well, to help you exit your individualism and your self-centeredness. A few days ago, I was at uh, one of our summer camps, and I was hearing students' confessions, as I usually do. At some point uh, in the afternoon, a father stopped by after work to see his daughter. He was a construction worker, totally burned from working outside in the hot sun. And I happened to be nearby. I greeted him. And uh, uh, his uh, daughter ran up to him. And I, being so near, I could not help but overhear their conversation. Oh, Daddy, I need 40 pounds for some of my needs here at camp. Oh, I also need 10 more pounds for a field trip to the village of Pelendri. And, uh, oh, yeah, I also need 10 more pounds for a telephone card. In a matter of a couple minutes, she took his entire paycheck for that day, and he gave it to her with much joy. And I thought, look at this man. He worked all day long in the scorching sun to make 60, 70 pounds. And in a matter of a couple minutes, he gave it all to his daughter. As simple as this may seem to be, 
It is one of the most basic actions of salvation in marriage. This man could have said, Honey, I worked eight hours for this money in a scorching heat. This money belongs to me. I, I, I want it for myself. I need to go out and relax, go out to dinner with friends, have a few beers. Why should I give it to you? This man did not even think any of this type of thing, but he transcended his selfishness and his joy was to provide for his child, to sacrifice his selfishness and give his hard-earned money to his daughter. The same thing happens when we give alms. We learn to share our material goods with our needy brother. This is also a way to defeat our selfishness and to exercise the practical side of love. This is a necessary attribute of our makeup. We are made in the image of Christ, and Christ exercised perfect love by surrendering his entire life for mankind. He also taught us that the greatest love, the most perfect love, is for a man to lay down his life for his friends. This is the movement that completes and perfects man's existence. Man needs to come out of himself, expand his heart, and love his neighbor as himself. This is where Adam needed the help of Eve. He needed to exercise this sacrificial love towards the other person in order to reach theosis, to become godlike, and more specifically, Christ-like. Initially, this most basic energy of our human soul, the energy of love, was turned to God first, and through God, it loved the other person and all creation properly. After the fall, man was disconnected from God, and this energy of love was no longer filtered and sanctified through God. So now we love people in our natural environment without God. God was somehow taken out of the equation. And here's where our greatest dilemma begins. In the absence of God, we idolize our relationships, we idolize ourselves, we idolize creation, our husband, our wife, children, and because we have lost the measure of healthy and wholesome love, we don't know how to love. When we idolize people, creatures, and things, we become full of destructive passions. This love does not pass through the thermostat of God's love. If it doesn't pass through the thermostat of God's love, it remains extreme, conditional, and ill. Imagine a heating system without a thermostat. The boiler can raise the temperature to 100 degrees in a winter, and the cooling system can uh, bring the temperature down to 40 degrees in the summer. Our relationship with God, our relationships with God, our love towards God will serve as the thermostat to properly regulate our love to all those in our environment. So the law of God in the Old Testament and later in the church in the New Testament offers the preventive medicine to safeguard people against the wrong and pathetic expressions of the energy of love. The medicine comes in the form of a commandment to teach yourself to teach you self-control and abstinence before marriage and to limit you to one partner after marriage. The first commandment will turn your loving energy towards God and through God, it will free you from the careless, hedonistic tendencies so you can learn to look at the other person as a child of God, as an image of God, as a person and not as an object of pleasure and gratification. If this preparatory spiritual work does not take place, then our Christian marriages cannot differ much from those of the world. If God is not in the center, then two things usually take place. One spouse may idolize the other, which is very tragic because they limit their eternal self to someone finite and temporal. Or they go to the other extreme to become bored 
of the same thing and to begin to look for love and excitement outside of marriage to spice things up a bit not because they're bad people they just want to spice things up a little bit to break the routine the end result is to shipwreck their entire family and to add to the yearly statistics of marriage failures that's why our church and the gospel in general calls for abstinence and self-control which is a great and commendable struggle, especially in the early years, the years of the youth. As young people, as young Christians in your church gatherings, in your youth events, you are called to like, love, and respect one another. Man is a psychosomatic existence, and you need to be careful so that your noble feelings of Christian love that you feel for those in your immediate environment uh, do not slip into a carnal and fleshly attraction which tends to captivate the mind and distances the noble and pure feelings which may result into many unpleasant consequences. This is one of the most important struggles in the life of the young Christian especially in this terrible age of pansexualism where premarital relations are promoted as normal and healthy. We are at the very sad age prophesied by Isaiah the prophet where people will call something black, they'll call it white, and the white black. All our church fathers who lived and properly interpreted the gospel teach that unless a young person transcends these carnal tendencies before marriage, he or she will have a difficult time to keep his or her bed undefiled during marriage. Abstinence and virginity is certainly helped by watchfulness, fasting, prostration, the mysteries of the church, and various spiritual exercises, but these practical works are not the main antidote for these passions. The main antidote that will keep these passions at bay is the love of God. The carnal fire can be extinguished by divine eros, divine love according to St. John of the Latter. That's why the love of God is the very basis of all of our works and the most important of all commandments. This was the state of the early Christians. Their spiritual love was so advanced that early Christians were baptized totally naked. They kissed each other in church during liturgy. The martyrs were declothed during their martyrdom, and the rest of the Christians were present, but they had the mind of Christ. Their eyes were pure, and they were able to rise above the carnal plane. This is the antidote that will keep you from looking at your future wife as gender, as a woman. She's not just a woman. She's also that unrepeatable person fashioned in the image of God. She's not simply your wife or your lady or your woman. She has a name. She is Eleni, Christina, Mary, Barbara. She's that helper that will help, help you transcend your carnal, hedonistic self. Today we have a huge problem because we place most of the emphasis on the sexual aspect of marriage. This contradicts the plan of our Creator, who did not simply give the commandments in a form of a book, but out of His inexpressible love for us, incarnated to also teach us in person to seek the kingdom of God first in all aspects of our life, and especially in our marriage. When we seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, then everything else will be given unto us. And this certainly includes a successful and blessed marriage.